according to Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to his gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? The gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. <coughs> this Gospel is kind of a strange one, but I think it is applicable in our day and age. It seems like as Jesus was teaching, some people had come forward. And Jesus was talking about repentance and the true meaning of repentance. And so he looked at these people and he said, I suppose you want to ask me about these Galileans. Now this is an interesting portion in our Gospel text because it only occurs in the Gospel of Luke. It is not mentioned anywhere else. There is also no historical record of this, but that is not a surprise. What happened, as scholars surmise, is that these Galileans had come to Jerusalem to do what they were called to do, and that is to make their sacrifice at the temple. And it would appear that as the Galileans came forward to make their sacrifice to God Almighty, that Pilate sent his troops in and slaughtered every one of them. Jesus said, you probably think that because this happened to them, they were the worst sinners out of all the people in Galilee. He said, but that's not true. Truly I tell you this, if you do not repent, you will find an end just like they did. He says, I suppose you people think that those 18 people who happened to be crushed to death when that tower at Siloam fell, you probably think that they were equally as bad, the worst out of all the lot in Jerusalem. But truly I tell you, if you do not repent, you will find the same end as they. Now a lot of people read this and they fear a lot. A lot of people interpret this to say that if we don't repent, then we're either going to get crushed by a tower, or somebody's going to come in here and do us in. What Jesus was talking about was that if we don't repent of our sins, then the wages for our sin is death. Jesus has been preaching that all along. And that God loved this world so much that he sent his Son into the world so that those who believe in him might have eternal life and not death. And that is what Jesus wanted the crowds to know and to understand. But he also wanted them to understand what this repentance was that he was talking about and why it is so important and why it is important for us today. Because I still have so many people, when they find out what it is that I do, whether it's at a funeral or a in a nursing home, a hospital, or even when I'm out socially, they will always ask me a question. Why is God punishing me? 
Why has God made these bad things happen? My answer is, stuff happens in this world because it is a fallen world. Can you honestly believe a God who would send his son into the world to die upon the cross so that we might be forgiven our sins would actually go around zapping people because they didn't do right? Do we believe in a God who's going to take you out because maybe you forgot to come and pray somewhere or because you didn't give enough of your income to the church or because maybe you forgot to be nice to someone? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it seem right then that if God was a vengeful God like that, that these people that we read about in the headlines every day, that we'd be reading their obituaries the very next day, because God would take them out first? Jesus says, not the way it happens. He tells us that sin is sin, and all of us sin. And if God were a vengeful God, there'd be no one to talk to. Rather, he says God wants only the best for us, and God wants us to know his love and his mercy. And so what he wants us to do is to repent of our sins. Well, how do we know that we sin? All we got to do is look in the mirror. All we have to do is recount what we did, sometimes before we even get out of bed. And yet, we sin. How do we know that? Because God's Holy Spirit lets us in on the secret. God's Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. That's part of what the Holy Spirit's all about. Letting us know that we've screwed up. But God's Holy Spirit also then says, but in Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. That when you repent, all is made right again. Now the Holy Spirit also tries to help us remember our baptism. Our baptism, well, in the Lutheran faith, happens once. A lot of times when we're still in our parents' or grandparents' arms. Other times it could be as adults. But it happens just once. Now, how are we supposed to remember that every day? How are we supposed to remember that baptism, especially if we were only weeks old? Well, Luther says that we need to remember our baptism every day. And I guess it would be very similar to this. I got married once, 40 years ago. But every day I have to work on that marriage. I have to remember those vows that I made. Because if not, then that marriage becomes worthless. That marriage falls apart because I am not an equal participant in it. That's the way it is with our repentance. That we are an active participant in that act of repentance. That God's Holy Spirit says, you messed up. And then I say, yeah, I did. And then I turn from that sin by the help of God's Holy Spirit. Now that's the other part that we tend to forget a lot of times. Repentance itself actually means to turn around or to turn your mind around. What repentance is not is a get out of jail free card. What repentance is, is that when we recognize our sin by way of the Holy Spirit, then we say to God, forgive me and help me to turn around. Why is that so important? Let's say that you go into an area, whether it is in a tropical jungle area, and you contract a deadly disease. You are taken to the hospital, and the hospital gives you a cure for that disease. Do you go running right back into that very same jungle looking to get that disease all over again? That sounds stupid, doesn't it? Or how about if you go out west sometime and you're going through the desert and you see a bunch of snakes and they start rattling at you and you reach down and get bit and pretty soon you find yourself laying on the sand and somebody rushes you to the hospital, gives you anti-venom. Do you go running back out of that desert 
and look for those snakes and start grabbing them by the tail again. Maybe you're a fool if you do. And yet, we are that way in our sin, are we not? We come to God and say, God, yes, you're right. Your Holy Spirit has to do to me on my sin. God, I'm sorry. Give me the magic bean and I'm going to continue on sinning because I know you're going to forgive me every time. Is that repentance? No. Repentance is saying, God, you are right. You are always right. I have done wrong. And in my baptism, I know that you have claimed me as your beloved child. And in your baptism, you have given me your Holy Spirit so that I can know that I am wrong. But I can also know that because of your son dying on the cross for me, I have been made right with you and I can be forgiven. That I can come before you and honestly say, God, forgive me and help me to turn around. And that I must cooperate in this and not continue to look and continue that same sinful act that I've been doing, but rather to be turned by God and trust in him that he will guide me. To show me not only the way, but how it is that I can live in that way. The Apostle Paul saw that his church in Corinth hadn't gotten the message. That even though he'd been there and established the church and, and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, when he left, he got all kinds of reports about things they were doing. And so he had to write them. And that's what our second letter was about today, our reading today. Paul was saying, guys, think about the nation of Israel, that God took these people out of bondage from Egypt into the wilderness so that they could find the land that he had promised them. Now, along the way, they went through the Red Sea. They actually were kind of baptized in the waters of the Red Sea. That's the language that Paul used. Then he also said they were fed in the wilderness by the hand of God, they got manna and quail. It was almost kind of like a Eucharist of sorts. And just as they had been favored by God, just as they had been baptized by God, just as they had been fed by God, they too continued in their sin. And what happened to them? A lot of people got taken out. They died along the way. They died before they truly understood or truly felt the repentance. And so Paul tells his church in Corinth, the same is for us. We have been baptized in the waters. We have eaten from the body and blood of Christ. And yet if we continue in our sin, we too might perish. Because we just don't know when our last day is here on earth. We cannot continue on in the ways we are saying, well, God will forgive me tomorrow, because guess what? Tomorrow might not come. And then where are we? Well, we're not in a happy place anymore. You see, once we recognize, by the way of the Holy Spirit, our sinful nature, we can ask God and we are forgiven. No questions asked. But we also then must turn away from that sin. Whatever it is that's causing us to sin, we have to divorce ourselves from that. We have to say, hey, this is not what God would have me do. And then do our darndest with his help not to allow that to happen. Will it happen again? Possibly. But the ultimate goal is to make it so that we recognize it and that we try and stay away from it. And with the help of God, we You see, Jesus then teaches about this fig tree. And of course, he's talking about God, who is the owner of the vineyard. And God says, three years. That fig tree's been in the ground three years, has not produced one stinking fig. It's time to get rid of it. The gardener says, sir, let me amend the soil. Let me give to it what it needs. Let me dig around it and let me care for it. And then next year, if it doesn't produce, then cut it down. Well, that is Jesus, of course, who came to bring God's word to amend our lives, 
so that we might finally hear, might finally produce that good fruit. Now that doesn't mean I expect people to go out on the street corner and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone that comes by, but there are many ways in which we share this love with others. There are many ways that we bear this good fruit. Last night when I received that call from Kathy, she was so thankful and just overwhelmed that you could hear it in her voice. She was so thankful that Betty Lou and Brenda took the time, and it was a lot of time, to be with her through her ordeal. To know that somebody cared enough about her and Buddy and what was going on to actually do something. That you know when we hear about all the things that happen in the world, one of the first responses we hear out of everybody is, our thoughts and our prayers are with you. You know what? That's a good thing. But what's even better is actually putting our faith in action and doing something about it. And it doesn't have to be a grandiose thing. Rather, it can be the smallest of things. Actually being with somebody in their time of need. Cooking a meal for someone who maybe, well, isn't able to do so for themselves. Maybe going out and visiting those people who are shut in or who are sick. Maybe it is recognizing those on the street that society would rather just forget about. Maybe it's just taking time with someone who may be hard to love, but recognizing it's probably because they aren't loved and they don't know how to reciprocate. You see, that is when we bear good fruit, and we don't bear that fruit in hopes of receiving salvation from God. We bear that good fruit because we have already been forgiven. We have already been promised salvation in Jesus Christ. So it is our response to everything that we have been given. That if we believe in Jesus Christ, we know that we can come to God after being told by the Holy Spirit that we screwed up again. And trusting in Christ's mercy, we can turn from our sins and know that we are forgiven, that we are made whole once again. And that happens every day, sometimes every moment of every day. And in that, we are free. In that, we are children of God. In that, we know that no matter when our last moment on this earth may happen, that we have nothing to fear. But we know that God loves us. He loved us enough to go to that cross. He loved us enough to give us all so that we might live.